Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, Lisa, Deb, and I are going to talk about some new information that we've just come to our awareness that a group of impact investors and creative types that had previously been associated with a large entertainment conglomerate um, and that large organization would be very familiar to most of you, have purchased C.G. Jung's private residence in Kusnacht, next to Lake Zurich, and also his tower in the village of Bollingen on the upper basin of Lake Zurich. Um, these developers have began to very um, carefully leak plans for development, some of which have been set in motion already. We understand that this is going to be an integration of uh, artificial intelligence and like like robots, some of which uh, will be recreated as significant figures from the Red Book, as well as historical figures that we all know uh, through our reading and research. There'll be some virtual reality elements and, strangely enough, actual rides that will provide uh, sensate experiences that are, in a very creative way, relevant to analytical psychology. So this is a new day. Uh, all of us are quite surprised, but perhaps we shouldn't be because this is the way the world is going. Uh, and perhaps good things will come out of introducing people to Jung's work and his history in this highly engaged and dynamic new paradigm. And of course, as we'll discuss, it's very controversial. You know, it sounds like based on this information, you know, really what we're talking about here is a theme park, a theme park, maybe more for adults, but it, it strikes me as a little weird to tell you the truth. Although I can see the benefit in exposing people to an immersive sort of experience of Jung's ideas and work, but it's, wow, what a, it's just shocking, really. You know, I was, I was absolutely shocked when, when I first got wind of this, Deb. And, uh, you know, I, I agree that it, it, you know, essentially what we're talking about here is a theme park. And what really uh, worries me is the commercialization of these ideas. And of course, I, I can see the other side. I mean, you know, some of the details that we've been able to garner are that there are going to be kind of traditional theme park kind of rides. So for example, there's going to be something called Dream Mountain, which will be a state-of-the-art roller coaster and, you know, sort of inside a giant dome. So it will be very dark. And as you travel through the twists and turns of this roller coaster, you will be exposed to randomized very highly realistic dream images, some of which will be nightmarish. So it will be as if you are traveling through multiple dreamscapes while you're on this roller coaster. So, you know, I have such a mixed reaction to this because on the one hand, it sounds like a wonderful way to just engage the unconscious and increase people's awareness about dreams and how magical dreams can be. And on the other hand, it just seems like a, a crass, material, materialistic, uh, grasping, just uh, mining this for its commercial value. Well, it has an opportunistic quality to it. My understanding is that the properties had come available in a rather unfortunate fashion, and this investor group had swept very quickly in and taken possession of it without the Jungian community being aware of it, because I could imagine that there were a number of 
dedicated Jungian organizations that might have rallied mm -hmm. to try to both oh, sure. protect Definitely. Your, these uh, your venerated sites. But this is, I suppose, the way of the world and money and power, and but also creativity. A new kind of creativity is breaking through these old barriers. I think all of us have been interested and wondering how will Jung stay relevant for another hundred years and being realistic about it. People don't want to buy physical books anymore. They want them to be digitalized. Artificial intelligence seems to be integrating everywhere. On the other side, this could be a kind of puer dynamic, a, a rebirth of Jung's thoughts, experiences, and potentials in this immersive entertainment environment. And of course, I was really imagining what Dream Mountain could look like, what it could feel like. And much like active imagination, I could imagine that for some people it could be quite overwhelming and even psychologically dangerous. And I'm hoping that the consultants who are involved with this are insightful enough to know what an average person could tolerate if they're exposed to that intense archetypal content. Well, I can imagine in a way that it could serve as a really powerful introduction to the life of the unconscious. On the other hand, it really does seem like a pretty risky, psychologically speaking, uh, endeavor. And, you know, and then there's all the other stuff that um, we've gotten wind of in addition to this Dream Mountain ride. But, you know, all these sort of uh, animatronic or robot-inspired enactments of some of the figures from Jung's uh, imaginal experiences. And once again, I can sort of see, oh, it's an introduction, it's an experience, it takes people into the world and mind of Jung. Uh, but on the other hand, is it kind of just commercializing you know, what What we've valued so very highly. Well, I have to say, though, Deb, <laughs> that when I heard that they were going to have a, a, an animatronic Philemon and Salome at Bollingen, I, I, have to, I, I would love to see that, you know, I really would. There's that something would exciting so cool. about it, yeah? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. Or, and is there another one about the sermons from the dead where they return from Jerusalem? Yes. I mean, that's... Yes. I, I know, it's really, I, I agree with you, Lisa. Uh, part of yeah. me says, no, 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 don't do this to Jung's work. And another part of me says, God, that I like would fun. really love to experience uh, some of the things that Jung experienced, albeit in a very virtual way. I would love that. Yeah. So so my understanding is what, what you're talking about is um, this uh, Seven Sermons to the Dead. It's going to be called Septum Sermones Ad Martios in, in the Latin, and that's how mm. Jung titled it. And, uh, and it's going to be right. You know, it's, it's, it sounds like it's going to be a little bit like the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a famous theme park ride mm -hmm. from which the films were later developed. Um, it was a favorite of mine when I was a kid, and now we're going to get to experience something very similar, only inspired by this uh, incident that Jung had in his life with where there, there was a lot of uh, kind of psychokinetic experiences. There was the bell in front of this house ringing wildly, even though there was no one there. Apparently that's going to be recreated. Yeah. And then you're going to get to hear the dead come back from Jerusalem, oh. Jerusalem and, and speak uh, in Latin, I think. So, uh, you know, that, that could be just incredibly exciting. It, it is, as you start to describe some of this, it's one of those things where it's sort of like, you know, how could any of us say, no, we really don't want to experience that. I would like to experience it. You know, it all depends on how they do it, doesn't it? Joseph, wasn't wasn't there something about, um, isn't there going to be a hotel put up on the property or something? What, what do we know about that? I think there is um, a zoning conflict that's happening. As you know, 
uh, Switzerland is a very um, careful about how development happens, particularly in these historic sites. So the bit I've heard is that there is an agreement that all the original buildings, at least externally, must remain intact, although legally they are able to change the infrastructure, uh, they're able to um, excavate and create what would be required, these massive underground systems yeah. in order mm, to support sure. this technology. So I think that part of it seems to be in place. They are in negotiation and they have some extraordinary plans for creating something like a monorail system from oh. the various sites to the hotels, which would be in the outskirts of the village. Hmm. Got it. And even the idea of the monorail, which would reach over the historic sites, so there would not even nice. be an interruption of traffic. But the hotel uh, is actually slated to be about a mile outside of um, Bollingen, and it, it's Beautiful. going to be an enormous compound, yeah. uh, much like that famous hotel Atlantis. Oh my gosh. Which wow. is going to cater to this enormous God. variety of physical experiences and be luxurious and all inclusive. And so I think they're, they're really trying to give people a sense that this will be uh, impactful and initiatic even. Mm. And at the same time, frankly, catering to people's need for rest and relaxation and pampering. Yeah. You know, Deb, I'm remembering when you and I went to Bollingen in 2019 and somewhere on our Instagram, I think there are photos of us there. But I remember we, we, we sat and had a coffee in one of these little lakeside towns, just short, you know, just a little ways outside of Bollingen. And it was just so charming, you know, with this kind of medieval architecture and this delicious coffee and the Swiss pastry and the view of the lake. So I, I can see how this could be a really um, exclusive resort experience with this very interesting entertainment uh, piece. It's interesting. I wonder how they got investors to go in on this, though. I mean, it's a little surprising that they feel like there's a market for this. It's It doesn't really surprise me, actually. It You know, as we're talking about it, I realize what appeal all of this has. It's totally new to many, many people in the public who are interested in novelty, interested in psychologically minded kind of stuff, interested in a whole new experiential realm. And that, you know, I know that investors, when they're really planning something big, keep it all really, really quiet until all the deals are done and then the big reveal of, of what's going to go on these monorail things, I, I'm aware that so much of this is going to be underground, uh, saving them from having to buy up, uh, you know, a ton of uh, surface level property of that there's an, some kind of underground train that's going to take people from Seastrasse, the residence, uh, to Jung's private retreat at Bollingen, you know, where apparently you can really have experiences of of the shadow and anima animus and a complex and various other kinds of things that are core to Jung's theory. So I, I'm, I mean, I can see the appeal. Who would have thought that Jung's body of work would lend themselves to such a project? It's incredibly creative and this synthesis between this arcane wisdom that Jung had revived and this emergent technology and also providing it in a way that young people can be introduced to this work. I imagine these environments will be curated carefully, that they'll have a dimension that is very appealing to children, even young children, who will be exposed to these various symbols of transformation often through merchandising, uh, and then the kind of assistance that all of us need at midlife to be able to be exposed mm -hmm. to these transformational yeah. ideas. Now, there is a point of uh, 
controversy around all of this, which has to do with the ro- development of the robotics, that there is a bit of a, uh, I'm not really sure, fight or conflict about which of the historic characters from Jung's life should or could be transformed into these robotic entities. And one of the contra- uh, controversial figures is Sabine Spielrein. Oh, um, sure. As, as it was in his life. Um, so my understanding is they're going to have depictions of Jung at various stages in his life, as a boy, as a young man, as an older mm-hmm. man. Mm-hmm. And I think there is some conflict with the family about whether or not these various um, anima figures, relationships that were important, Tony Wolf, yeah. whether or not they will be depicted and invested in with mm-hmm. the same enthusiasm that uh, Jung and Emma would be, although I think there is a great pressure for this to be historically accurate. Oh, wow. That's, that's oh, really that's, fascinating. Well, and there's good, there have to be th- activities for children as well as for adults. I mean, a lot of this sounds much more geared to adults, but the sailing camp is going to be uh, for kids and they can learn to sail, you know, right there on the shores of, of Lake Zurich with miniature replicas of Jung's sailboat with its famous red sails. Mm-hmm. And then there are going to be some of the um, you know art programs like mandala drawing and so on that was so central to Jung. And that's something that adults can enjoy, but children will also get into. And there's with mosaics and watercolors and crayons and all kinds of mixed media. Uh, so I get that, you know, this can be a family event and maybe the, the children can be off doing the sailing camp while the adults are doing some of the more uh, intense experiences. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. That I think is part of this um, compound, the hotel compound. Mm-hmm. There will be smaller outlying experiences. And my understanding is that they are going to create a children's experience based on the Bergholzli Mental Institution, a hospital that Jung was working in early in his career. And it's going to be kind of an immersive children's camp. Um, They'll be able to sleep in these kind of 18th century cots. They'll have their meals together. And the experience is based on the farm cure that they used in the Brooke Halsley. So children will be able to wear, you know, special white uh, clothing, just as the patients did in the Brooke Halsley. And they'll be moved out in groups to learn how to garden and work in the orchard and provide um, small maintenance tasks for the Berkholzli uh, institution and really understand how transformative it was for people who were so vulnerable, who had such few resources and were cared for so carefully. Uh, there'll also be opportunities, as I understand, for art therapy and another, a number of other expressive kind of arts, which will be manned by local children's art therapists. So it will have a, a deepening experience for the children, but also it will allow children to, to develop a kind of empathy for what it was like to be struggling, you know, in the in the 18th and 19th century, which uh, to me it seems rather remarkable. Oh, I'm just thinking if you were a parent and you just wanted a break, and what a great thing you could get away with your with your spouse, put the kids in the mental institution, and just enjoy yourself. Absolutely, I'm not literally put them in a mental institution, of course, but to give them this uh, this immersive experience mm-hmm. um, of, of what that was like. I think it's bold, very bold. It's, it's sort of like an outward bound experience with um, sort of a psychodynamic theme and intent. Is that kind of That's it? That's a great way of putting it. It's a great way of putting it, Deb. Yeah. I don't think so. I, my feeling isn't that this is literally a treatment center, but more an immersive thing. So much like that kids may go to a dude ranch and hmm. dress up like oh, cowboys. and. And what's it like to live um, 
in the Midwest in you know 1850. So what would it be like? You know, it's 1900, and it's uh, what would it be like know, to have hysteria? Origin. Well, I think that would <laughs> that hmm. I think that would be very interesting. Yeah, um, that's a great. It is a very broadening experience. I think that's it. It's about broadening children's understanding, but also it sounds like they're trying to make it fun. Hmm. You know, hmm. fun at the mm -hmm. Berkholsley. I, I think I might want to call it something other than the Berkholsley because I think the um, the reference to a mental hospital is a little a little heavy, but I, who knows? I mean, all this stuff is still in development. I like the I like the idea of uh, such an experience for kids. I think the empathy that will rise out of it will be remarkable. Right now, I think the working idea is it's based on the Berkholsley Psychiatric Institute, but I I have no sense that that's how it's going to be marketed, but it's in development along with the other kinds of opportunities. I know that um, part of that installation will involve a kind of mud experience that, um, because Jung, of course, spent time playing at the shores of Lake Zurich mm -hmm. in the mud, creating these very important figures and structures, which was a kind of art therapy and he was interacting with these figures as a way of integrating his experiences. So they are building these enormous, very carefully created mud tracks as uh, something adjacent to the Berkholsley so the children can also have this experience of being there in the sun and the wind and the beauty of the lake and forming these small kind of uh, figures and towns and villages that represent mm -hmm. these psychoactive mm -hmm. elements that children have inside of them. That seems uh, very rich to me. Hmm. You know, <clears throat> there's another thing I think they've done that's very clever is um, in, in Jung's house, uh, there's, there's a, a big room. I think it was the dining room, if I'm not mistaken, that had a view of the lake. It's a really beautiful room. Mm -hmm. They're going to convert that into a bar, oh. and it's going to be called the Alchemist's Laboratory. Oh, wow, how fabulous! Yeah, and it's gonna it's gonna specialize. Uh, it's it's gonna create you know these sort of specialty cocktails. So, for example, the Calcinatio. Oh, that which is just a, a fiery combination of different uh, liquors. The Salutio. You know. Oh, I get it. That is very cool. And then they're building, aren't they building some sort of a see-through glass roof out so that people can sort of dine in the very expansive backyard? You can have uh, hors d'oeuvres or sandwiches or something right there. Yeah, I think they're going to focus on like um, like traditional local um, Swiss cuisine, like hmm. raclette and, and various meats and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Pickles you know, and yeah. so much room for a creativity. One of the things I would really enjoy um, is really the opportunity uh, to access the library experience. Uh, oh, and yes. they're this they're is taking key. they're supposedly they're going to be taking Jung's study, you know, um, much like the people who replicated the images in the Red Book with incredible accuracy. And they enlarged them so that when you buy a red book, the illustrations are exactly like they were in the original. They're going to do the same thing with Jung's study. They're going to enlarge it so that it can hold more people and have it be exactly architecturally accurate with every book and every single thing in it. And uh, you can sit and through headphones and some sort of visor, et cetera, you can have an in vivo experience of the, apparently they've downloaded most or all of the collected works and correspondence and all the rest of it. And there's going to be some sort of virtual reality experience of, of Jung. That sounds remarkable. I, I, this is really where everything is going into this metaverse. So for people to come into a comfortable setting like Jung's library, put on the equipment, and then actually feel that they are touring 
and touching and interacting with all of these objects, be able to read through these books. And of course, because it's virtual reality, if you uh, touch some of the ancient languages, then there's a, a translation that immediately happens. So there's all of this assistance to really enter mm. into the mm -hmm. mind set and lived experience that, uh, that Jung had. Undoubtedly, the impact is going to be tremendous. And then, um, I guess it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, although it's a part of the design plan, that they're going to have a small coffee shop off of the library called the Caffeinatio, oh. which I think is hilarious and delightful. Oh, that's great. That's great. I love it. You know, love it. That's we wonderful. all love our Caffeinatio, yeah. you know. <laughs> You know, this this is the the really expansive part of the vision, right? Because they're going to, you know, working off this AI model, they're going to kind of feed into the AI all of the collected works, all of Jung's unpublished work, you know, biographical details that we know about him. And so there will be a, sort of an AI Jung that initially will only be available at this site but my understanding is eventually they're hoping to just make it freely available online. It's going to be called Chat CGJ. Huh. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you think about the implications of this, I mean, I, I you know, it's going to potentially put us out of business because, you know, why would you want to come to one of us when when you could just log on to your computer and, and have a analysis with the master himself? I think this is something that is of great concern uh, internationally with the young community. Mm -hmm. I mean, on one sense, wouldn't it be wonderful for people who would not normally have access to this kind of process, mm -hmm. to be able to log on to a computer, to be able to hear, you know, young talking to them about their contemporary issues. But it really, it really challenges the idea that a temenos, a certain kind of temenos, is required in order for transformation to occur. So I wonder, will this be a kind of psychoeducational experience, or whether or not real transformation and the incarnation of the self, real individuation, can happen in this, in, in that way? And I suppose we'll find out over time, undoubtedly I'm biased, imagining mm -hmm, that the living right. relationship yeah. is the thing that is curative. But we may be shocked. That they're getting smarter all the time, and it's, you know, it's just gonna... Uh, I, I had understood that it was gonna be more interactive with the content and the collected works and Jung's other writings, but what I think you guys are saying, and it makes sense given where all this uh, automated AI is going, that you could actually have an analytic experience virtually. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's with, with, that's amazing. My understanding is that at this um, you know resort that they're crafting. Uh huh. The AI will initially be available in a, a sort of advanced kind of robotic version of Jung so that the conversation you'll feel like you're really encountering him. But the, the AI component, I understand, will eventually be available just just widely. I mean, it would be, you know, just think about it. You could just bring your dream to AI Jung and have him tell you what it meant. Oh you my know? gosh! I, mean, I can imagine sort of put the podcast out of business, you know. Uh, but think of the spinoffs that lie ahead. Here, you could also consult with Marie Louise von Franz and Barbara Hanna and Tony Wolf and Freud. Emma Jung and Oh Freud. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that would be the final uh, mending of their relationship, wouldn't it? Be a really beautifully poetic justice for there to be access to Freud in the in this young uh, recreation. I have to tell you a funny story that uh, I had heard as I was interacting with uh, some of these people uh, surreptitiously, that they were floating an initial plan that in each of the hotel rooms there would be a robotic head of Jung whose lips would actually move and be connected 
to this AI intelligence so that you actually could be seen and speaking to Jung in your room and that they would decrease the expenses by only having the head on one of the bureaus um, in the room. Uh, and then when they were actually doing some marketing testing, people found it so horrific Gosh, to have so a talking head in their room that they yeah. had to abandon it. Yeah. But I really thought what they, they are really pushing the boundaries yeah, of how they're imagining sure this is going to work. You know, like you're having a shower and shouting over into the bedroom to have a chat with Jung's head in your room. Oh so, uh, you know, I, there's no end to how people no. want to apply it, but I'm, I'm glad they didn't take that element. Mm, that's really strange. You know, one of the most ironic parts is, Deb, the, the recreation of Jung's study that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. They're talking about doing that whole thing to Jung's house and putting it on the strip in Vegas. Oh, my goodness. I suppose you mm. could recreate the whole thing, couldn't you? You could recreate the whole thing, yeah. Just and not strip. have... Wow. Well, it'd be... Mm -hmm. per it's sadly, weirdly perfect for Vegas. Isn't it? I mean, Isn't I get it. it. Really I really get it. I'm really sitting with that. I'm... I'm really taking it in and really asking my psyche what it might be like to be walking down the Vegas Strip and kind of just see Jung's house tucked in. Or bowling in. To consider, or bowling in, which I think is a little right. more theatrical, between mm -hmm. you know the Bellagio sure. and the next uh, hotel next to mm -hmm. it. Mm. I, I guess uh, my question would be, and what do I know about marketing, that... Uh, it might be difficult to give people that same sense of pilgrimage if it were there in Vegas. I mean, to have to go to Zurich, to go to the lake, you're kind of being psychologically prepared to arrive. Hmm. And even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking some people do think of Vegas as a pilgrimage. You know, it's so it's such an American, iconic uh, city. So what do I know Maybe people would just be blown away to see the uh, Bollingen right there and be able to go inside and have these experiences. I, I mean, if it worked, it would be remarkable you know, to insert that kind of Jungian dynamic in the kind of hedonistic, dynamic vortex of Vegas. No, but this is where I, you know, this is exactly what I worry about is that this whole experience could be cheapened by putting it in Vegas. You know, if you, put, if you have another location that it's on its own distinct property, let's say in the United States, but it's on a lake, et cetera, where you could be faithful to the recreation, I could see it. But planting it in the middle of Vegas, I think, uh, really waters it down and commercializes it something awful. But Deb... The Philosopher's Stone is found in the dung heap. Oh. Uh, well, oh, my goodness. You know, right? Right. So it does, in a way, it's perfect for it to be in Vegas in exactly the place where you wouldn't expect it. Wow. Right. Because when you were talking, I was thinking, well, like, Lake Tahoe would be great. I mean, that would be comparable in its beauty and its pristine. But as you're saying... As you're saying, Lisa, for people to be going from a certain kind of libidinous world and then to, to be awestruck you know, by the significance of Jungian work right in the middle, just right as that uh, you know, hot dog is hanging out of their mouth and their you know, margaritas in the other hand, and then they're, they're you know, about to go in and see a burlesque show and then their heads turn and there's yeah, Bollingen. Exactly. You know, and this, I mean it's this kind of call from the unconscious. And you're in you're in this authentic mm -hmm. experience of shadow. Right. Right. And it's like and a glimpse of the great in a way you're really close to the unconscious. Absolutely. You're in all that in way instinct. That you wouldn't you wouldn't get that in Tahoe. Well, that's so interesting. The other thing I'm imagining is that people would have to go repeatedly uh, because this whole process of, of a depth experience and uh, the process of individuation couldn't really be done 
entirely in just one visit, but I imagine repeated visits uh, would make quite an impact on psyche. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's what the developers had in mind, oh, too, of course. is that you'd have, you know, a lot of repeat business. And like other amusement parks, I imagine people could get a season pass or maybe even a lifetime pass. Mm -hmm. so, so exactly, it would clear the way for them to have a circulatio, to return and return on a higher arc to these encounters. I'm imagining with this enormous investment that they're putting in, at least I hope, that this would also continue to evolve, that as this entertainment industry learns to integrate these Jungian concepts and operationalize mm -hmm. them through these immersive environments, that ideally they would become more impactful over time. Are they doing um, a special dream incubation location, or is that just an option you can have in your hotel room of how you can really ask for a dream and have a dream and work with it uh, the next day? There like must be something like temple that. Temple or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. I I, thought I, heard some, I I remember reading something about that, and I think that um, you know there there are a couple different spa options because of course there's a spa there, but w one of one of them is um, that along with your spa experience, you can have some you can have a shamanic journey that could include dream work too. So I think it's kind of similar to what you were saying, Deb. So you can get you know, a facial, a massage, and and then a shamanic encounter. Yeah, and you, know, you the, have There are different those, packages available. You have that abaissement du mental nouveau experience while yep, you're exactly already, yeah. on, you know, on, on the massage table or something. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. can see, uh, I mean, the possibilities are pretty uh, incredible, actually. What I would imagine is they would add a kind of psilocybin clinic as, as part of the Institute, uh, although my understanding is that Switzerland being very conservative has, is still limiting research access to that. But just as you were saying, Lisa, to be able to go to the hotel and perhaps even as an offshoot of the Burkholzli Children's Camp, that there would be another separate institute that's extended off of the institutional building where people could have curated psilocybin experiences, perhaps even in a slightly immersive environment that would nudge people towards Red Book styled experiences and really be captured in that dream world. Uh, and then of course guided by artificial intelligence that wouldn't even have to be manned by uh, living people, but they might have that kind of animatronic or, or rather uh, artificial intelligence available to companion somebody through this extraordinary hallucinogenic vortex. Uh, I mean, I'm making that up, but, but I could totally see that being a next step of impact as this is developing. There are so many possibilities here. I can see that they had no trouble at all getting investors for this. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's be, really rich, isn't it? What, whether it's for good or for ill, and it will probably be both, as we all know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's going to be big. Uh, people are going to want these experiences. Of course they are. And you know, what I, what I heard is that they're expecting this to do very well. And if it uh, performs as well as they're hoping... The next project would be a uh, kind of theme park devoted to Joseph Campbell that would be called The Hero's Journey. Oh, wow. Well, we all know how much Campbell and Jung admired each other, mm -hmm. so I could see that as a natural extension. Uh, now, I would find that incredibly uh, exciting. And as you had mentioned Outward Bound earlier, Deb, there's all kinds of applications yeah. for it's this kind of idea. An, of, an initiatory theme park, really. I mean, but an honest, initiatory theme park. Honestly, what I would really like to see uh, with this kind of extension or just the initial model it is some room for people to come and kind of have a serious retreat 
But okay, maybe you do the spa, stay in the hotel, do the rides, all that jazz. Uh, but stay on and uh, really be able to have some seminar type experiences uh, with people or even with AI where you delve into the collected works a little more, uh, read some myths, um, analyze some fairy tales, work on your dreams. I, I hope they will have that kind of a component. Yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit geared more toward like, um, for example, they're going to have corporate events there so that, oh. you know, big corporations can bring their their staff and it can be a meeting. Wedding venue. Yeah. yeah but, you know, and, you know, in fact, there's there's going to be a whole package called the conjunctio. Perfect. Right. The, the Mysterium bridal suite, something like that would be perfect. I mean, I, that's brilliant. Absolutely. And if they could have this very curated um, image where brides and grooms could even be garbed in the way that Emma and Jung might have been at that time and within that culture. So, it, you know, like people go and have those photographs taken where they're all dressed up like they're in an 1800s saloon, you know, that they'd be able to have an immersive historic uh, fashion experience. I think there would be an enormous appeal in that. But Deb, I want to go back to you. Um, your feeling about it having a, a legitimate psychotherapeutic impact. And what I was thinking that the hard sell around that is that uh, the Jungian community, particularly in Europe and perhaps in uh, Switzerland, would have to really overcome their envy of what uh, has happened this enormous blossoming of uh, Jungian thought and this repurposing of these organizations? Will they will they rise to the occasion and participate in this? Because I would imagine they would need skilled clinicians, and that's going to I imagine be quite a process for the analysts in Switzerland to kind of to buy into it and get involved. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a clash of cultures, really, I think, you know, this sort of um, American, because this is primarily an American conglomerate. It's an international conglomerate, but based based in the United States. And, and this kind of corporate, profit-motivated kind of sensibility. I was thinking they could have, you know, in effect, visiting faculty from all around the world. Uh, you know, that an analyst would come and spend six weeks or eight weeks or something and conduct seminars and be available for consultation. I would love, I would love to do that. I would love, it sounds like so much fun. A kind of uh, Aranos could spring. Oh, you know, right. Of, right. An Aranos. Yes. It, that's exactly perfect. Joseph is, um, you know, that's my interest is that there's a real, learning serious component to all this. And Eranos was an annual, basically, seminar, week-long seminar where people really shared ideas. And if there could be an Eranos type component, I would be, I'd be interested in going. I guess, you know, I wouldn't be able to resist some of the other attractions. But I think that is what would draw visiting faculty, visiting analyst consultants from all over the world. I think that's the vision. Now, we don't know that they're planning on this step, but you're really offering a way to marry, you know, the old and the new, mm. you know, to hold mm -hmm. the tension yeah. of yeah. the opposite. That would be nice, yeah. And, yeah, and it's vision. so important to hold those tensions. Isn't it? It really is. And it will be. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that people are going to be very surprised at this new information we're releasing going to create a lot of surprise in yeah. people but again holding that old and the new mm -hmm. and also holding what our fantasies are about how it should be versus the reality principle that you know the, the contracts have been signed things are in motion so you know what's the unifying symbol that is going to emerge that allows the Jungian community to move forward honoring both the old and the new without diminishing it, and yet resolving the tension in a fascinating new vision for, for how to move forward. 
Wow. Well, it holds out the promise of the union of the opposites, which really is the pinnacle of Jungian work. You know, on that, I, I just want to say, Joseph, you were talking about the option uh, to have uh, the the um, Carl and Emma wedding. Mm-hmm. There, there is going to be another option, and it's going to be called the Rosarium, and it's and it's a little more um, it's a little more out there. But in the Rosarium wedding package, the bride and the groom will actually begin garbed as the king and queen, mm-hmm. and then. They will meet and um, shake hands with their left hand. Mm -hmm. And then when they actually experience union, they will be naked and in the bath. So it's a a very uh, different kind of wedding ceremony, but they're expecting it to be quite popular. I think the revival of ancient images and practices at that level of detail could transform the whole institution mm. of marriage. I mean, to really be in the conunctio and sinking downward into the into the hot bath. Uh, I'm not sure how they'll do this technically. Maybe it'll it'll be some kind of a, an enclosed pod. You know, I, I know I've seen on YouTube these weddings where people can stay in these hotels under the water, which mm. is uh, reminiscent yeah. of mm. that. Yeah. To be able to descend into that experience and really surrender to the blending and to, to come wow. back up reborn wow. and made into one thing, the rebus, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. It really takes destination wedding to a new depth. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, it's really cute because um, if you opt for that package, they make available these invitations that are like woodcuts, huh. you know, and it says like save the date oh. and, it, and it looks like this woodcut and, um, you know, and, they, and the, the, the wedding favors are like these little glass retorts. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just so clever. All that intricate marketing and evocation of the spirit of the rosarium, and again, making it relevant to the modern psyche. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the mission of this Jungian life, is to take these arcane ideas and really mm-hmm. put them in people's hands while they're having a cup of coffee, while they're out in the world, mm-hmm. and while their kids are around. Yeah, so maybe this is just a, a really brilliant thing that yeah. uh, e- even though we, we all experience some fear and resistance around it, but maybe this is taking these yeah. ideas to a new level. To really live Jungian ideas, experiences, and theory. You've been listening to April, April Fools. Fools. <laughs> You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.